So what if you're trying to, if you have a hypothesis, you try to prove it, and ultimately you find that it's not the that thing. You are not able to prove it. So kind of it's a negative result. So how do you proceed with it? Discard it. <laughs> you know, the thing is, uh, you should not uh, get wedded to an idea. I mean, it's possible that uh, hypothesis means that you had a certain set of experiments at a certain point of time, and based on that, you develop a hypothesis. Hypothesis is not a theory; it's not a dogma, which is a, like DNA is a dogma. You, know, you have to accept certain things because everybody proved. So we all tend to develop. Like I have developed a model. You know, okay, we say this is my hypothesis. This hypothesis was based on a certain set of experiments, certain data. Not only what the data was there, but also my knowledge and my interpretation of that data. That becomes very important, you know. So because you sometimes interpret based on what I have learned. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes we take decisions on ignorance. We are ignorant about some other things, so we made made a hypothesis. So later on, when you become a little more knowledgeable, you do some more experiments. You have more technology coming up. There is advancements in many technologies, and you find that yes, probably my interpretation was wrong. The hypothesis should not have been this way. It should be something else. So you change it. So it's no harm in changing. You know, uh, it's a dynamic. Science is always dynamic. It's never static. We never know the truth. What you know the truth today is based on what you have today. The truth can also be different. So science is never absolute truth; it's approaching truth. We are only approaching the real truth. Of course, in philosophy and theology and other things, we already know the truth. <laughs> that is the difference. But here, we don't know the truth, so it keeps coming. I have a general question. So our conversation started with uh, whether you believe that teaching has some influence in research. So you said it has a strong influence again. But is it a general idea among the researchers in India or scientists in India? Uh, I'll just take an example, like when people, when scientists, when professors are recruiting students as a JRF or as PhD students, and if the student is not a fresher, then they will never ask if you had any teaching experience or if you have taken any seminars or anything. But they'll ask, do you have any uh, working experience, some research experience? So yes, because. Uh, The, because you are coming to the research institute, <laughs> that's why that there is a faulty system in there. That there is a uh, research institutions. They feel that whether you have a research experience, you have done certain experiments and all that, because it's again an easy way out. I was telling, because you need a person who is already trained, and he can get onto the experiment on day one. Whereas in the university system, probably this may not be absolutely true, you know, because uh, it depends also on the person who is recruiting and all that. So I always uh, felt that uh, if somebody doesn't know anything, is the best for me because uh, now I can tell him what to be done. Otherwise, he's already put up his mind on that. It depends. Uh, But teaching makes a difference because you can uh, tell people, you know, when we teach, we teach what is known. We never teach what is not known, unknown. Unknown means a lot of things which are known. so. That is the question which you have to. The teacher has to put up those questions. So that's how I used to do it. You know, I used to teach even to physics students biology on algal systems like wall walks. You know, these are the two single uh, multicellular kind of single uh, organisms which come and attract each other. Now the question was, which was always there, in a whole ocean. How does a positive strain finds the negative strain? It's a huge ocean. They are floating around, and they mate finally. You know, they come together. It's not mating in that kind, of, but they do produce. How do they find each other? In a huge atmosphere. So uh, that was the question raised. But after some time, we got the answer uh, that uh, these uh, produces certain pheromones, and these pheromones can be sensed at the concentration of 10 to minus 16. By the other one, so even if it's the distance, so it's a kind of way you bring people into thinking. Thank you. Even in botany, when we were taught, uh, they used to tell us the life cycle and leave it there. You know, I used to get bored in a way that, <laughs> uh, but you had to pass examination, you had to learn. Like I don't know, many of you may come from botany or something. You teach fungus system, neurospora. 
Now, you teach the life cycle, but you don't tell how Neurospora was used to generate a hypothesis of one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. That part is totally missed by this. So that thinking, historical perspectives are never taught how people develop these hypotheses. You tell the end product, you don't tell it. So teaching can make a difference. Uh, in fact, in one of the teachers' training, uh, which we, I started in JNU when I was a teacher there, not now, uh, they have a course is called Academic Staff College, they have to come. So there were teachers who used to uh, take uh, certain lectures. So after I gave some lectures, you know, this fellow said, I want to do PA research with you. I said, why? He said, those are the few questions which I want to uh, work on. He was a teacher from Bihar, from Muzaffarpur or something. So I said, I can't do this, it doesn't come like this. He was already PhD, but he wanted to do postdoc. He said, I have to do this. And he got out of my life, I tell you. <laughs> Finally, we got him into the lab and he worked two years with us. And after that, he turned out to be so good, we sent him out in Eugene Nestor's lab, which did this agrobacterium, well, uh, one. And he did a postdoc there, came back, and he continued with his research. This fellow, he could not do research in that place, but after that, he wrote grants and all that, he did it. So you can, it depends uh, how it works out, you can influence. Uh, people. Because basically human mind is a curious mind. As I was telling you, sometimes we kill curiosity. There is a book written by our Chancellor, JNU Kelly Kedi. Physics is he and his son in NII, they have written a book on curiosity. Oh, Rahul Pal. Rahul Pal. And Yash Pal. Yash Pal. You have seen that book. I have that's the a, book. That's a very, very nice Tricks book. You should read it. Like, yeah. you know. Even small little things which we observe in day-to-day -day life. And one of that is uh, how to make jalebi. Now, what, why does it become, you know, thick and other things? What is the basis behind it? We never think about, you know, there are so many things around us. Uh, like, how does television work? Many biology students would not know. They don't want to know also. Or how does this mobile work? It is in your hand. Mobile when you move from room to room, from here to outside, it doesn't get disconnected. Why? What is the system operative there? So, uh, I mean, that curiosity, which uh, we don't have, looking at even things around us. So I think that way teaching can help. Science, uh, do in your laboratory whatever you want to do, but uh, read other things. Many other things. Read what is happening in chemistry, material science. May what is happening? Someday, material science will be used for many other things. Do you know they are creating thermometers with DNA? DNA thermometers. Really? Yeah. So instead of mercury, uh -huh. you are replacing it with DNA, huh. because DNA has a TM temperatures. You know, the two helix move at a different temperatures, and uh, that's what they are using that technology to create uh, DNA thermometers. So, uh, think, uh, think differently. We <laughs> don't uh, training we don't probably think that way. Read more, think different. You prescribe that. Essentially, you are saying ki watch living science. <laughs> yeah, watch living science. Uh, living science has a meaning. In living science means not only in your own city, everything around you. Watch that, you know, watch, ask questions and uh, find answers. There are some, many things where answers are known, but sometimes we don't know. That enriches if you know more than what you are doing. My professor in uh, Delhi University, Professor Maheshwari, I used to work in tissue culture and all that. How did I get into all these other things? Because he had given me 30 topics like histones, transcription, light, phytochromosis, 30 topics which I had taken on which I would collect literature. And that did, in those days there was nothing like uh, what you have today getting into this. You had to go to the library, look at current contents, you know, and which journal publishes. And for each 30 topics, we had three, 30 notebooks. So we used to write down each one, which was the best, read, discuss, talk, and expand into it. Many of my colleagues who started with tissue culture are still with tissue culture. It happens, you know, so we have to expand. 
But I think there is a message here, no, don't no. get very Crick. into uh, Crick changed his subject at the age of 50. He went into neurobiology and cognitive science after spending so much of time with the DNA structure and other things. So one day it occurred to him, that is where move, where your interest takes you. But Abhi, right now do your PhD and finish it. <laughs> Don't start doing anything. You know, otherwise all your uh, supervisors will be after my life. <laughs> Ki, they are only reading something else, not doing their work. So do what you are doing, do best and take the best advantage of whatever is existing all around you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much.